Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it, especially coming out to a talk with such a ghastly title. But um, it's something that I think is of great importance, and this is what I want to talk with you about tonight, is this issue that I've been thinking a lot about, which is that repeatedly throughout history, groups of people have inflicted violence on other members of the population. Um, and they have inflicted this violence in coordination with the authorities, and against groups of people in their society that were no direct threat to them and were defenseless. And so what's going on here? How can we understand this sort of thing, uh, this facet of, of human behavior? Because it's of deep importance for us to understand this if we want to prevent it in the future. So, uh, of course, we're familiar with the Nazis and their killing of millions of people based on religious and ethnic and political um, uh, events. Um, this is... Uh, this here is from the Nanking Massacre in 1937 when the Japanese invaded China and killed hundreds of thousands of unarmed civilians in China and systematically raped between 80 and 100,000 people. Um, this is from 1915. This is the systematic killing of the Armenian population by the Ottoman Turks. And uh, in, it's estimated that between one and one and a half million Armenians were killed during this. Um, and then in, in uh, 1994, in the period of 100 days, uh, the Hutu in Rwanda killed 800,000 Tutsi, and this was um, accomplished with machetes. And at the peak of this, they were actually achieving a higher killing rate with machetes than the Nazis had accomplished with gas chambers. And so the question is, what's going on here? So, uh, historians, you know, this stuff is well documented, and historians point to issues about political and civil strife and economic troubles. But the real issue is that the only way these events can happen is when there's a distinct change in the behavior of individuals. And how can we understand that change in behavior? So what I want to tell you about tonight is the science of what we understand about that, and I want to put together a new framework to see how we can understand this sort of thing and end by saying what we can do about it. So let's start at the very beginning. So it turns out when we think about human evolution, um, the story that we all know about Darwinian evolution is that it's survival of the fittest, right? So you have to be a really good competitor in order to be able to survive and do well. And the, that's a pretty good story, but people started realizing there was a little bit of a problem with um, the issue of altruism, how does that explain why people help each other out? That's not taking care of just by thinking about individual selection. And that got people thinking about kin selection. So it turns out that there's this notion of the selfish gene. And if I share some genetic material with my brother and with my cousins and so on, then maybe that explains why I want to help them out. That's known as kin selection. In fact, the evolutionary biologist J.S. Haldane uh, once said, I would gladly jump in a river to save two of my brothers or eight of my cousins. And so it turns out that's the way that biologists think about kin selection. But it turns out even that's not enough to explain things. Because in fact, people get together and they cooperate irrespective of kinship. And that led people to this idea about group selection, which is to say, if you are the kind of person who cooperates with other people, then as a group, you all get selected up. As a group, you do better than people over here who aren't very cooperative with their neighbors. And so there have been many books on this. These are just three books from the past year on this issue of group <laughs> selection. And the, ter the term for this is eusociality. You meaning good or positive. So it's this positive social thing where you get this glue, irrespective of kinship, that allows you to build tribes and groups and nations. OK, so, so the author, Jonathan Haidt, uh, gave a nice analogy for this. He said, as a result of this evolutionary history, when you think about humans, we're sort of 90% primates, meaning we're all about the individual competition, and we're 10% honeybee. And by honeybee, he means you know sometimes we all come together for the good of the hive. And that's the kind of thing that can't be explained just by individual selection, but instead it really is this issue of selecting 
for whole groups that makes us want to work with one another. Now, one of the costs of this is that you get in-groups and out-groups. So let me just concentrate on the in-group part of this for a minute. So what happens with in-groups is you get people saying, OK, look, we're going to cooperate with one another, and we get to enjoy all the benefits of that. We get to cooperate and work together, and everybody benefits as a result of that. And it turns out it's not just humans. There was a very recent study that showed that you even see this in, for example, rhesus monkeys. They have in-groups and out-groups. And this is on an island in Puerto Rico. And what you can do is take pictures of all the monkeys, and then you show the monkeys pictures of the other monkeys. And just by the way that they look and they react, you can measure who's in their in-group and out-group of their monkey troop. And this even works with monkeys who just switched troops. So two weeks ago, these guys were their in-group. Now it's their out-group. And you can see the change in their reaction. So it's fast and dynamically updating all the time. And it shows that monkeys really care about who's in their in-group and who's in their out-group. And of course, there's this issue of religion, too. And I know that sometimes the neo-atheists will talk about religion as being like a, a pathological virus. And, and that's actually not the right way to think about it. From an evolutionary point of view, things are judged by what they cause people to do. And what religions cause is for people to group together, to be eusocial. So, so what happens with religions is you define a group, you coordinate the behavior of the group, and, um, and you incentivize the group to cooperate and work together. So as, you know, as one evolutionary biologist in the late 1800s said, religion is just, it's just another weapon in the Darwinian struggle for survival. In other words, if it were maladaptive, it would have gone away. But it's actually, it is adaptive because it causes groups to come together and work together. OK, so what does all this have to do with the brain? Well, it turns out that historically, traditionally, We've always studied the brain by looking at individual bits and pieces of it. So you say, OK, well, this is how vision works, and this is how hearing works, and this is how decision making works, and so on. And it's only in recent years that people have begun to appreciate that, in fact, a lot of the brain's circuitry has to do with this eusociality. A lot of it has to do with how you interact with other brains, trust and reputation and allegiances. And this has led to a new field called social neuroscience, which studies this sort of thing. And that's what I'm going to tell you about tonight and what that tells us about group behavior.